Hi again. Today, I thought um, I would talk about resilience. I haven't done a webcast for a while, and this one's been on my mind. So I thought before summer hits, let me get this done so I can get it out there. And if you have any questions or concerns about uh, what I mentioned, feel free to email me. Um, and I, I get my email a little bit over the summer, so I can email you back. So today's topic is resilience. A while ago, I shared a webcast on stress and anxiety and their effects on children. To sort of piggyback on that, I thought I'd share what I've experienced and learned about resilience. There are many reasons why we see more anxiety in children in today's culture. They have less time outside, um, they're on technology more, the use of social media has grown, the breakdown of the family unit as a whole, peer pressure and academic pressure, especially in our area. And when I say the breakdown of a family unit, a lot of families um, are intact or working really well. However, um, we used to you know, sit down for dinner and share parts of our day, and now people just don't have time to do that. Everybody's running this way and that, and we forget that the relationships and connectedness are really important. We also, as parents, tend to help our kids so that they don't make the same mistakes we did or so they don't suffer the negative consequences. We remove their stressors rather than help them manage their way through the crisis and troubled times. We are, in the long run, doing our children a grave dis injustice. Resilience is being able to back, uh, bounce back from life's challenges, and it can be nurtured in all children. From what I've learned, our biological stress response exists to protect us from harm or to prepare us for something that's meaningful to us. The stress response is initiated by the amygdala in the lower part of the brain, right above that, um, at the base of the skull, top of the neck. And messages are then sent from there to other parts of the brain to release chemicals to help the body deal with the crisis at hand. So stress is actually um, embedded in us. It's a survival skill or a survival uh, response. So it's natural. The stress, the, um, we are seeing more teen suicides and physical and mental health issues because of anxiety related causes. Kids can't problem solve and fear that whatever crisis they're in is the end of the world. It's insurmountable. According to Dr. Bill Stixrud and Ned Johnson from their book, which I've referenced before, entitled The Self-Driven Child, The Science of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. According to them, we are better off acting like um, consultants to our kids rather than bosses and business managers. We need to help our children navigate the world they're living in rather than control everything for them. Here are two examples. Your child forgets his homework and doesn't want to miss Fun Friday, so he calls you or texts you and asks you to bring it in. You take time out of your busy day and bring that homework to school. He doesn't miss Fun Friday and he didn't suffer any consequences. What did he learn? Instead of remembering his homework the next time, he learned that you'll bring it if he forgets it. Now this isn't every time. Of course, sometimes you want to take it in. Um, I'm speaking of generally just doing it all the time. Once in a while, there are more emotions um, or it's something that may be easier for you, but we have to think before we do it, is it necessary? A friend of mine also told me that her daughter called from college because she locked herself out of her dorm room. The mom said, what am I supposed to do? She's four hours away. But the daughter, the first thing she thought of is, I need to get my parents help. And of course we want them to ask for our help, but not for something like that. They need to go, they need to be resourceful in the environment they're standing in. We're not helping our kids problem solve by fixing their problems. We are crippling them. Another huge example is the college entrance payouts we've seen lately, but we don't need to go there. The talk of, topic of resilience makes me think of Mr. Pineda, our fall intern. His parents immigrated here from Mexico, I believe, and took two to three menial jobs each 
in order to take care of the family and give their kids a better life. Christian had to do his own laundry and chores from a very early age. He told me he was started doing laundry at five because they were each supporting the family in the best ways they could. Today, he and his sister are first-generation college-educated counselors that their parents can be very proud of. And I know from my experience of a teaching of 19 years before becoming a counselor, um, the most responsible kids were the ones who had expectations and chores at home. So I know as a parent that has helped me um, parent. You can watch the live webcast, or you can watch the webcast from last November where I interviewed Mr. Pineda. It's 20 minutes. You might not want to watch the whole thing, but it's pretty impressive. So, according to one of the articles I read in preparation for this webcast, there are 10 tips for building autonomy and resilience in your children. Don't accommodate every need. Sure, you're going to help sometimes, but think before you do. Do before you do something that saves them from learning a much needed, needed lesson. The lesson might be more important than the thing in that moment. Avoid eliminating all risk. It's hard to watch our kids suffer and fail, but that's what they need to do in order to prepare for the time when no one's there to save them. We offer support and let them know we'll be there to help them through the crisis and that they will survive. Bad times don't last forever and neither do the good ones for that matter. Teach the kids to problem solve. Ask them questions. What do you think you should do? What do you want the outcome to be? What would you like for me to do? Teach concrete skills, role play. If a shy child is nervous about going to a party, teach him or her how to start a conversation. Ask questions, validate their shyness, validate their reluctance to go to the party. Listening to the 10% Happier podcast on mindfulness, I heard someone say that the way he got over social anxiety was to announce loudly on the subway, Michael is here, every time he got in a car. No one paid attention to him and nothing really horrible happened. So that was his way of just putting himself out there. I don't suggest that for kids at a party, but I thought that was humorous and usable. Avoid why questions. Why did you do that? Ask how questions instead. How do you think you can fix that situation? How do you think the other person will feel? How can you handle feeling left out at the lunch table, for perhaps? Don't provide all the answers. Say, I don't know more often when your child is trying to problem solve. When a child is worried that she might not know anyone at a party that she's been invited to, and she really, you can tell she or he really wants to go, don't let him cancel it. Ask her how, how he or she's going to handle the situation instead. Ask him what some possibilities are, what to look for they, when they go into the party. What are some ways that they can feel comfortable? What are some things they can do to make a friend or just to have fun just being there? I know one of the tricks as far as being a kind of a reserved adult is when you go to a party and you don't know anyone, ask what you can do to help because that gives you something to do and you probably will get to know a few people in the meantime. Avoid talking in catastrophic, catastrophic terms to your child. You have to pass this test or you'll have to repeat the grade. If you don't join a sport, you're not going to have any friends. Catastrophic. Let your kids make mistakes. Let, this, let them see the consequences of their actions. Our brains actually grow more, become stronger, when we fail at something and figure out a way to make it work. Successful people aren't people who never failed. They're people who never gave up when they failed. They constantly figure out new ways to solve problems. They persevere. And I know that from reading the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. She based her studies on successful people, what makes some people successful and others not so much. And it's not that the successful people had more money or were smarter. It's simply that they kept their eyes on the goal that they wanted. They persevered. So failing, although disappointing, is sometimes something you can learn from. What did I do wrong? What do I need to fix? So mind, growth mindset is the people who persevere, 
who learn from their failures and mistakes. Fixed mindset is I'm done, it's too hard, I can't figure it out, or I know enough. And we're all a little bit of each sometimes, but when you're learning something new, you definitely want a growth mindset. Help your kids manage their emotions. All emotions are human and okay to feel. It's what you do with those emotions that make all the difference. We have to let them be uncomfortable and be uncomfortable ourselves with their discomfort. I understand that you feel that way, but hitting your sister or throwing a fit does not solve the problem. It makes it worse. And breathe. I was listening to another podcast, and actually it was from Super Soul Sunday with Oprah. Um, I don't normally listen to that, but my sister sent it to me. And the person she was interviewing was Sister Joan Chittist. I think Chittist. Anyway, um, I'll try to put that on the website later. But she was talking about how in our culture today, we are, we like convenience and comfort. We don't want to be uncomfortable and we don't want to be inconvenienced. But both those things are necessary and we need to let our kids know that it's not going to kill you to be uncomfortable. It's just going to be uncomfortable. Model resiliency. Between teaching, counseling, and parenting, I can't tell you how many times I feel like I've messed up. When I planned a lesson poorly and it didn't go the way I wanted it to, I'd scrap it, admit defeat, and either redo the lesson or move on. Lesson learned. Frustrating, but what are you gonna do? The other day I was having a rough morning. My ticket, I I got a ticket for expired tags, which I haven't fixed yet. Um, I forgot to put the coffee cup under the Keurig spout. You can imagine how that went. I couldn't find my ID, and I said on the way to school to my son, if one more thing happens, we're turning this car around and I'm going back to bed. Most days you persevere, and other days you cry uncle. Either way, you survive. Parents, friends, fellow teachers, help your kids by helping them less. Teach them that this too shall pass, because it will. A lot of the things I've talked about this year are related, resilience, mindset, and mindfulness. We are handicapping our children when we solve problems for them because they can't figure their things out. They get so disappointed, they feel like it's the end of the world. Provide the toolbox and the safety net. Don't take the test or the lesson away from them. If they're having trouble with a teacher, help them figure out how to talk to the teacher and get involved after you've given them some time to handle it themselves. Finally, find ways to connect with your kids and your family this summer. Relationships and connectedness make all the difference in how your family functions and how your kids thrive. Any suggestions, please email me and I look forward to having some more webcasts in the fall and next year. Thanks and have a great summer.